ACS and MI. Acute Coronary Syndrome or ACS is a set of one or more conditions that cause the blockage of blood flow to the heart muscles resulting in a myocardial infarction or MI. The heart is a muscular organ that pumps blood containing oxygen and nutrients to the rest of the body. The left ventricle is the main pumping chamber of the heart and contracts to send oxygenated blood to the rest of the body through the aorta. Several smaller arteries known as coronary arteries are connected to the aorta and supply the muscles of the heart with the necessary oxygen and nutrients. In acute coronary syndrome, there is a blockage in the blood flow through the coronary arteries, usually due to an atherosclerotic plaque, a coronary artery spasm or a coronary artery dissection. In atherosclerosis, the continued deposition of a fatty plaque results in the narrowing of the involved coronary artery. Rupture of this plaque results in the formation of a blood clot, thereby causing a blockage of the involved coronary artery. The formation of a blood clot is the most common cause of a coronary artery blockage. Other less common causes of coronary artery blockage include a coronary artery spasm, which is triggered by drugs, smoking, cold weather or extreme stress, resulting in a sudden tightening of the coronary artery or a coronary artery dissection, in which the inside wall of the coronary artery separates, resulting in a blockage to the blood flow. Such a blockage to either of the coronary arteries results in oxygen and nutrients failing to reach the part of the heart supplied by it, causing the death of the heart muscle, a condition known as myocardial infarction. Symptoms of a blocked coronary artery include sudden pain or discomfort, tightening or a burning sensation in the chest, known as angina, which may extend to the upper abdomen, shoulders, arms, neck or lower jaw. Angina occurring at rest or as multiple episodes preventing even moderate physical activity is known as unstable angina and is commonly observed in acute coronary syndrome. Other symptoms of acute coronary syndrome include 1. Breathlessness 2. Dizziness 3. Sweating 4. Nausea Treatment of acute coronary syndrome or an MI usually involves the following. 1. Oxygen therapy to increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the blood and heart. 2. Aspirin or antiplatelet therapy to prevent blood clots. 3. Thrombolytic therapy such as TPA or streptokinase to break up existing blood clots. 4. Nitroglycerin and morphine to relax the coronary arteries and relieve the pain. 5. Beta blockers which reduce the heart rate thereby decreasing the oxygen requirement. 6. Coronary angioplasty an interventional procedure in which a balloon-tipped catheter is inflated inside a blocked coronary artery to open it with a stent remaining behind to keep the coronary artery patent. 7. Coronary artery bypass grafting or CABG pronounced as cabbage, a surgical procedure in which the blocked coronary artery is bypassed with a vein or artificial graft material in order to re-establish blood flow to the heart. Shock Hemodynamics Shock is a state of restricted perfusion or blood flow to the various tissues of the body. Perfusion rate can be measured in terms of liters per minute of blood upon grams of tissue perfused. Perfusion in the body depends on three main factors. Number one, cardiac output. Number two,
systemic vascular resistance. Number 3. Oxygen concentration in the blood. Cardiac output. It is the amount of blood pumped out of the heart per minute and is proportionate to the rate of perfusion. Cardiac output is measured by the following formula. Cardiac output is equal to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate and is measured in terms of liter per minute. Stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out of the heart with every heartbeat while heart rate is the number of beats per minute. While heart rate can increase or decrease based on the input from the nervous system, stroke volume is dependent on the preload, which is the volume of blood in the heart at the beginning of contraction, afterload, which is the pressure on the wall of the ventricle at the end of contraction, and contractility, which is the ability of the heart to squeeze out blood. Stroke volume can be measured as the difference between the end diastolic volume or the volume of blood in the ventricle at the beginning of a heartbeat and the end systolic volume or the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of a heartbeat. Systemic vascular resistance is the total resistance offered by blood vessel walls to the flow of blood, allowing it to be pushed along the blood vessels, enabling better oxygen delivery and as a consequence, better tissue perfusion. Resistance is largely dependent on the diameter of the blood vessels. The smaller the diameter, the more the resistance, resulting in greater tissue perfusion in the body. Oxygen concentration or oxygen saturation is the third factor on which perfusion is dependent as greater oxygen saturation results in greater availability of oxygen to the tissues resulting in greater perfusion. Oxygen concentration is measured by pulse oximetry or through arterial blood gas analysis. The factors that influence tissue perfusion also influence arterial blood pressure, which could also be a good indicator about the severity of shock. Mean arterial blood pressure can be measured by the following formula. Mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance plus central venous pressure. Central venous pressure, being negligible, is often omitted in making a rough estimate of the mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure could also be calculated with a sphygmomanometer or BP apparatus using the following formula. Mean arterial pressure is equal to two third of the diastolic pressure plus one third of the systolic pressure. 2D echo basics. One of the key principles to keep in mind while doing a 2D echo is that 3D structures would appear as cross sections in a two dimensional plane. While fluid and solid organs conduct sound, Bone and air do not, resulting in anechoic shadowing or dark areas. And as bone is uniformly dense, uniformly anechoic areas are seen, unlike with air, which has the classic shimmering effect because of a mixture of anechoic and hyperechoic areas. Common propositions while doing a 2D echo include fanning from left to right, angling. Rotation around a perpendicular axis. Sliding and stabbing. Some of the common positions viewed on doing a 2D echo include 1. Parasternal long view, used to estimate systolic function and to identify a pleural or pericardial effusion. This probe is placed on the third or the fourth intercostal space with the pointer directed towards the left elbow. Estimating systolic function is done by first identifying the mitral valve with the anterior leaflet and the interventricular septum. In normal systolic function, 
the anterior leaflet is seen to slap against the septal wall, as shown in the imaging. Depressed systolic function would result in the slowing of the slapping action, while a hyperdynamic systolic function would result in a rapidity of the slapping action, often leading to a decreased left ventricular volume. A pleural or pericardial effusion is identified by an anechoic area in the region of the posterior pericardium and the descending aorta. Absence of a separation between the posterior pericardium and the descending aorta indicates a pleural effusion, while the presence of a separation between the two indicates a pericardial effusion. 2. Parasternal shot view is used to estimate right ventricular strain. The probe is positioned by rotating it clockwise 90 degrees to the long axis at three different levels. At the aorta valve, known as the Mercedes Benz sign. At the mitral valve, known as the fish mouth sign. And at the apex, with the papillary muscles. The right ventricular strain, in which the right ventricular pressure is greater than the left ventricular pressure, is denoted by a D-shaped septum, caused by the bowing of the interventricular septum into the left ventricle. This is typically seen with the case of a large pulmonary reembolism. 3. Apical view is used to visualize all four chambers of the heart, including the left ventricular outflow tract, and to estimate the hemodynamics with a color Doppler. The probe is placed below the left nipple and pointed towards the direction of the right shoulder. Initially, all four chambers of the heart will be visible, but by decreasing the fanning angle, even the left ventricular outflow tract becomes visible. The apical view is the best position to estimate hemodynamics, as in this position, the ultrasound beam is parallel to the direction of blood flow, thereby allowing the Doppler shift to be visualized clearly. With the color Doppler, red color indicates that the direction of blood flow is towards the probe, while a blue color indicates that the direction of blood flow is away from the probe. 4. Subcostal or subzevoid view is used to visualize a pleural effusion. The heart is visualized via the liver by placing the probe 3 to 4 centimeters left lateral to the xiphoid process and pointed to the left neck. A pericardial effusion can be visualized this way by using the liver as an acoustic window.